Welcome to the Paul Christopher Show. This is Paul Christopher. There's a struggle in the world today, a conflict older than history. It's a competition of ideas and their proponents. It's about who's right and who is wrong and how major decisions are being made. But is it really? And how can we change this dynamic? The stakes are high because the outcomes are of great consequence for families, careers, industry, society, and government. The vast majority of us are quietly going about our daily lives while this war is being waged across all forms of media, the educational system, from pre-K through high school and college, religious and social cause organizations, government and corporate offices. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, we are all involved. Episode 1, Belief. This episode is inspired by a man I met last summer from Idaho. He was visiting family in Vermont and told a story about his neighbor, who believed in a certain religion and commented about his neighbor that, I don't care what you believe in as long as you believe in something. I've thought about this ever since and did some of my own research to determine whether this fellow was saying something I could agree with or not. As we have seen recently in American culture, the conflict between different beliefs can cause us to argue, shout, damage property, storm buildings, and break laws. But why are discussions about government, taxes, spending, what rights individuals should or should not have that are of great importance to everyone so emotionally charged, marked by shouting, hatred, and violence? Surely there is a better way to move towards meaningful progress in society where all voices can be heard and ideas shared with respect. If we want to get to this future, it is crucial to talk about beliefs, what they are, why are we so tied to them, how they are formed, and how to change them. We all have beliefs, but how much time have any of us spent understanding how those beliefs were formed and how valid are the underlying assumptions? Are we taking someone else's word for it, like a favorite news anchor, TV personality, organization, or politician? And why do we give such an outsized degree of power to our beliefs and let them dominate our behavior, attitudes, and mood? How much human suffering is taking place today because of our beliefs or the beliefs of others? The purpose of this podcast is to make human society better by questioning dangerous beliefs and reducing suffering. Let's start with the basics. What is a belief? Most people define a belief as that which we have accepted as true, genuine, or real. Simple enough, but how do we come to believe? And why do we humans believe at all? Where did this capability come from? And how does belief impact our lives and well-being? Well, fortunately, beliefs have been a study of psychologists for a long time. There's strong evidence based upon research that beliefs are vitally important to our survival for two following reasons. One, faster decision making. Two, energy savings. Research has shown that beliefs are shortcuts created in our brains to save time and energy, especially for routine tasks. This enables us to react faster to opportunities and threats. Our brains do this by recognizing patterns and using existing structures to make decisions and react to circumstances. Our brains are continually on the lookout for patterns and associations. We are making cause and effect relationships all the time, whether one exists or not. This has been the cause of much human suffering. For example, over 200 people were accused of witchcraft in Salem, Massachusetts in 1692. By the end, 30 people were found guilty, five died in jail, and one man was pressed to death, which apparently involves the barbaric practice of being placed under a huge weight until dead. All of this because of a mistaken cause and effect relationship that was 100% totally believed by the people of the colonies at the time, and they were 100% wrong. The pilgrims, as they came to be called later, and what pilgrimage were they on exactly, had a long list of death penalty crimes, including the crime of following other religions. Today, most people don't believe that witchcraft is real, and that it's a misplaced phobia or paranoia that sprang from the dark minds of people living under harsh conditions. We should not judge them too harshly, however, as any of us can fall prey to the exact same traps in the labyrinth of the human mind, unless we stay disciplined and ever vigilant against them. So why does the brain need shortcuts and belief systems at all? Well, we are limited by the amount of time and information we have available to us. As a result, we are forced to rely on biases and beliefs to make decisions. Further, these shortcuts reduce the amount of mental effort required. 
Do not assume, however, that the choices made are right. In fact, more frequently than not, we are making incorrect decisions faster, saving energy along the way. In business, it is not whether a decision is ultimately right or wrong that matters. Speed and the ability to make course corrections quickly are favored over lengthy indecision. In 2014, Jeff P. Lovell, Ross Newell, and John K. Parker in Research in Psychology and Behavioral Sciences magazine decided to determine whether English Premier League soccer referees had a bias for home teams over visiting ones. The study was to confirm what fans and media had always suspected, that referees did in fact make calls in favor of the home team, especially in contentious or close calls. Soccer referees train to make fair and unbiased decisions all the time, but their unconscious biases overrode what they were perceiving through their eyes, which is actually the brain doing the seeing, to make the wrong call. If the people whose job it is to remove bias from their decisions can't do it, then what hope does the average citizen have? Without science, data, and facts? None. If they are so often hopelessly wrong, why are the brain's shortcuts important from a biological perspective? If we are incorrect more often than right, how does this help us out in the wild? The sound of a twig snapping in the forest at night could well be a dangerous predator. With little time before an attack, run would be our brain's immediate response, saving our lives. The faster the action is taken, the more likely an individual is to survive. If it turns out that the sound was made by a fallen branch or harmless small mammal, it hardly matters. However, most of us do not face life or death situations daily unless we are crossing a busy street in a noisy city meaning that many processes of the brain are remnants from our development as a species, not necessarily 100% helpful in the modern world. The advantages of these shortcuts is that they take less brain processing power and time. It is much easier to skip all of the thinking and take the right action or make a decision. But these built-in pathways do not always work, which is why we make mistakes all the time. Thinking is hard. So how are beliefs formed and what are they actually? At the simplest level, our brains make associations that may or may not exist based upon our lived experience or perceptions. For example, if B follows A, then our brain makes the connection that A causes B. Knowing that game animals are attracted to acorns in the fall increases a hunter's chance at a meal by staking out the area beneath a mature oak tree that is dropping its fruit. This then forms a belief in the hunter's mind that hunting near oak trees in the fall will increase the chances of finding game an essential survival trait. These associations are neural connections or circuits that are created in the brain. When these circuits are hard-coded, the neural pathways are almost reflexive and unconscious, like the famous Pavlov's dogs. The ring of a dinner bell brought about a salivary response through learned conditioning in the animal. The dog does not need to think. The response occurs reflexively. This happens to us humans all the time, and some are very dangerous and harmful. However, this is not the entire story from a biological perspective. Making faster decisions is only one aspect of survival. In order to survive, an individual must not die of starvation or dehydration. Therefore, saving energy and operating efficiently are also competitive advantages. The brain is the part of our bodies that powers these capabilities. It is a complex and awesome organ. However, it does not come cheaply. It is our body's most energy-intensive organ, according to Simon Laughlin, professor of zoology at Cambridge University. A typical adult brain consumes 20% of the body's energy at rest, but only makes up 2% of the body's mass and contains 100 billion nerve cells called neurons. What is driving the need for all this energy? Well, the bulk of the energy is consumed at the synapses, the gaps between brain cells, to pump ions, exchanging potassium and sodium, to create electrical charge. This pumping action is key to the brain's activity, but it's extremely energy intensive. Certain activities such as hearing require faster, real-time processing and are more energy intensive. Others such as smell are slower, requiring less energy. The body's main source of energy is glucose, but the brain has no ability to synthesize or store it. The brain must be continuously supplied with fresh nutrients through the blood, this is why low levels of glucose in the blood can lead to impaired brain function or even brain death over a matter of a few hours' time. Beliefs, then, are an adaptation to help the brain conserve energy by making faster automatic decisions that require less processing power. Less neurons need to be involved. Less synapses and less ions to be pumped equate to energy savings. 
However, what a mess these beliefs have caused us in society today and throughout history. The brain is continually searching and creating causal relationships where none may exist. We now understand these connections to be hard-coded circuits or connections between neural pathways that can be quite subconscious. However, our brains can't tell the difference and we are fooled into thinking A causes B when the assumption is not true. Pavlov's dinner bell did not cause the dog's food to appear, but to the dog's brain, it certainly did. There are many examples of incorrect or false beliefs, starting with early man's explanation of natural phenomena as the actions of gods, or medieval medicine being thought of based upon flowing humors in the body, or the theory of spontaneous generation of life. The only way, though, to be sure of a causal relationship is through observation and statistical analysis. This eliminates the powerful biases of our brain and enables database decision-making versus emotional or biased decisions. As an example, as ice cream sales increase, so do murder rates. However, not many people believe that ice cream causes murder, although this can't be ruled out entirely. It's most likely a correlation, not a causal relationship. Another example are superstitions. Let's say a friend gives you a rabbit's foot for good luck and nothing bad happens to you that day. You are likely to associate the rabbit's foot with good luck, although undoubtedly bad luck for the rabbit. We are pre-wired by our brains to develop beliefs, to save time and energy. We get beliefs from our parents, teachers, cultures, and society. Further, we will develop our own beliefs through lived experience. The problem is bad enough when individuals are making poor decisions based upon false beliefs, but it's magnified when considering groups. We've seen how people with common beliefs form groups, or the reverse, people in groups start to organize themselves through beliefs that are then shared with new individuals, such as cults or secret societies. These groups can exert more power and influence when acting together than as individuals. There are clear advantages, but how do shared beliefs strengthen the group, and how would this help from an evolutionary perspective? Well, they increase the competitiveness of the group and therefore the survivability of individuals. Robert Boyd, professor of human behavior and social change at Arizona State University, argues in his book, A Different Kind of Animal, that norms amongst the group provide a scaffold for sharing decisions, limiting the scope of internal and external conflict, making the group more competitive. Cultural norms and taboos are generally created and spread by individuals deemed to have knowledge by the group, rather than by individuals trying to figure out how stuff works. How many of us have seen this in the workplace where people at the top make major decisions based upon their own beliefs, not necessarily the best thought out solution? This is how tribes have ended up with behaviors such as dietary taboos, food distribution rules, and unique codes of behavior governing courtship, marriage, and war. These socially accepted rules and taboos were not developed through observations and testing, but through imitation. Since we know that humans create a lot of mistaken connections or assumptions, a lot of maladaptive behaviors result. Maladaptive behaviors are those that stop us from adapting to new or difficult circumstances. It's ironic that a trait we've inherited to make us more competitive can result in behaviors that do the opposite and make us less adaptive to new circumstances. This is how major civilizations in the past collapsed, Circumstances change, but their ideology and practices did not. Okay, so why do humans get it wrong and follow incorrect beliefs, even to their destruction? Unfortunately, it's perfectly natural. Our brains and central nervous system are the result of millions of years of evolution. And what improved the survivability of an individual may not apply well to civilizations over the long term, or modern society at all. The brain evolved along with every other organ and cell in the body. The biological traits, which are archaic remnants of the past, create unnecessary stress and anxiety today. Just take a look at one of the most fundamental questions that has been answered by cultures across the world and time, the story of creation. All civilizations that we can think of have developed their own stories. Typically, the world, stars, and planets were created by a deity, deities or a character that already exists, out of nothing or a god or gods created the world out of themselves or something that was already created. These stories are universally not in alignment with measurements and observations taken from Earth. But nevertheless, those people believed, and billions of people still believe, in literal stories of creation, despite plenty of evidence to the contrary. Early humans, lacking the ability to record observations, track data, and review, are unable to develop a reliable story of creation, Instead, early astronomers were persecuted because of their observations, which ran contrary to accepted dogma. Observations, data, evidence, and practical applications of science, to the contrary, do not dissuade people who believe in their culture's story of creation. 
These are durable, multi-generational beliefs that have been transmitted through the millennia.